Hello, 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 and welcome to the Hashtag Five Things podcast, where we deep dive into five topics from social media and share our takeaways for the week. This week, we have everybody's favorite, Amanda Davis. Hello, Amanda. Oh my gosh, that's so nice of you to say. Hi. You are you are everyone's favorite, Amanda oh, Davis. Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. <laughs> I'm going to get letters from all the other Amanda Davises out there being like, I thought I was the favorite. Um, and this week, we have a new voice on the show. Tommy, welcome. Hello, Tommy. I thought I was the favorite Amanda Davis. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you are. In our hearts, you are. Hello, hello. All right. So we are going to talk about a lot of fun stuff this week. I think everybody is making waves. Uh, first, we've got YouTube. The YouTube Partnership Program officially passed the 2 million members, which is great for them. Facebook adds Reels to the app. Twitter launches the newsletter subscription uh, button right on the profile. So that'll be right there. Uh, TikTok partners with Shopify to allow in-app purchasing. Exciting. And Instagram is removing the swipe up feature, replacing it with stickers. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so Tommy is going to kick us off first talking about YouTube's partnership program. Tommy, take it away, my friend. Yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory with the title. Uh, the YouTube partnership program, for those of you who don't know, is actually what allows YouTubers to be YouTubers and make money off of their content, make money off of advertising revenue. It's officially reached 2 million partners, uh, just announced on Monday, and apparently They've had double the amount of partners join this year than they had in 2020 and 2019, just in the past calendar year alone, which I think is a pretty like, staggering number. The fact that there's 2 million content creators out there is just like, to me, that's overwhelming. I look at that number and I was like, and I'm like, if I was a new person coming onto the field trying to make content, I would like just be overwhelmed. I wouldn't know how to operate in that landscape. But I think it's interesting because one, it shows there's such a hunger for content enough to really fund and feed 2 million people's careers. But also I think it's a chance for like that number. Like I said, I would feel daunted by it. So it might move me to go to different platforms like TikTok, Reels on Instagram and now Facebook, as we're going to talk about later. Um, and I think it's up to people now to sort of figure out like as the market's becoming more and more saturated with creators, what's the best way to move forward and make an impression in such a packed field? Two million is crazy. And it reminds me that I should have been a video content creator influencer. Maybe there's still time for me. But I also was reading about this as uh, as it relates to YouTube shorts, which everybody I think was on the fence about, are people going to go from TikTok or Instagram to YouTube to watch short form content? And a lot of creators are actually finding, quote, insane growth going to YouTube shorts. People, get, you know, that start with 40,000 followers getting up to almost half a million in six months. Same content on TikTok or Instagram, but just leveraging it on YouTube shorts. And And I think some of this growth is contributing to that 2 million member mark. Um, so I think when we look at the features that creators are given, obviously TikTok has kind of led the way with creating a, a video editing option that people can tap into. But there is something that YouTube is doing to really push and monetize um, creator content on the platform that's helping them grow their following and get in front of uh, more eyeballs. So I think this will keep, this looks like it'll keep growing. So... Uh, with that many followers, I can, Tommy, I can see that you're, you'd, be, you'd feel a little daunted uh, by having 2 million other uh, creators on the platform with you. Do you think, do you think this is good for YouTube? And do you think maybe this keeps the advertisers happy um, having this many, this many creators on the platform? I think definitely. I think, I think it's two things. One, more partners means there's more liabilities. That's unfortunately, that's the kind of sad, not sad, it's the unfortunate aspect of this where more official partners mean just more chance for controversy, a la, you know, a Paul brother filming something he shouldn't and publishing it, like like PewDiePie back in a couple years, I forget what year, a couple years ago. So it's more, there's more chance for the brand to be reflected negatively by these creators. But also on the flip side, more creators means more 
content. It means more chance for advertisers to make money. It means more targets to they meet more groups to target specifically as content creators get more and more niche. So I think there's definitely pros and cons to the increased amount, but I think mostly the advertisers will see more cons and be like, great, more chances to reach people because people are watching more and more videos than ever. And more ability to keep people in the app of YouTube. I think YouTube was actually one of the first platforms to really, really perfect that algorithm of autoplaying the next thing in your feed without you having to click around and find the right thing. So They've had great, um, you know, AI algorithm intelligence that gets people to stay in the platform for longer. So again, the more content you have and the more that you can measure what's working and not working, the smarter that it gets. So I I can see them kind of sneaking up to TikTok's uh, infamous algorithm uh, draw and and kind of winning there too. Speaking of the algorithm, Amanda, why don't you talk to us about Facebook adding Reels to the iOS app? All right. This is going to come as no surprise, but starting this week, some users in the U.S. are going to start seeing Facebook Reels in their news feed and in the group pages that they're members of. This new update will also allow users to cross post their Reels content from Instagram onto Facebook. Again, this is chasing the TikTok features. It's not incredibly surprising. And and we've been like seeing tests of this for a little while. Um, It actually seems to be working, though. Facebook released that about half of the time that users spend on the app is used watching video content. And a lot of this is part in the growth of Reels. So what we're thinking about here is this is a slightly new audience that might not have TikTok. They might not be on YouTube shorts. It seems like other people are. So with this kind of addition and and inclusion of Reels into the Facebook platform, we're obviously going to see the same race to attract content creators, start making videos with Facebook's native video editor, um, and, and Facebook's going to be putting some money where its mouth is and, and paying these creators to make content. I think when we look at Snap, YouTube, TikTok, they've all committed, I think it's between a hundred million and $300 million each, um, to creators, but Facebook and Instagram actually says it will spend $1 billion paying creators for their content, um, along with additional bonus programs and seed funding. So This is a really big, it it feels like a small feature update, but this is actually a really big double down for Facebook to bring Reels into that platform and attract a totally new audience um, with something that seems like they already have have huge success in. Tommy, what do you think about all that? I was going to echo something like your last point. I think this is, people could be like, oh, of course, Facebook adds Reels. They're trying to, they added Instagram already. They're trying to, uh, you know, take from TikTok and make it work for them. But I think this is a really exciting moment for the, the race to corner the market of short form content. Facebook's such a behemoth, the, the fact that they, could, they can spend a billion dollars on content. And also, I don't think you mentioned this, uh, Instagram users can post their own reels directly to Facebook. And so the fact that they're leveraging two of the most popular apps right now, besides TikTok, um, together, it just makes it such a force. And I think also... Again, now that Instagram is a usually a more younger crowd, more than Facebook. Facebook also now has that older crowd. It has the grandmas and, you know, it has the Gen Xers who maybe don't feel most at home on TikTok. But now they have really the best of both worlds and the money to spend. I think it's going to be interesting to see what ways to move forward and what content really sticks and how people are able to find, you know, the best ways to leverage both of these massive platforms. So let me ask you a hypothetical. Um, I know Facebook and Instagram are two of the most popular apps, but hypothetical, do you think there's ever a world where they would make Reels its own app? I would venture right now. I can't say for sure. I would venture no. And actually, Joey, you're kind of touching on something that I was thinking about as Tommy was speaking is that we're really seeing this as a huge shift in how people use social media. So obviously when we had a photo sharing app in Instagram, when we had a a copy heavy app in Twitter, that's all really, really shifted across the board into short form video content on every platform. So I think Joey, it's a good question. And rightfully someone might have had a different answer five years ago, but I think the adoption of the behavior of just viewing short form video less than a minute long wanting that endless scroll of content and lo- and new things every day and exactly what my you know page knows that I want to see 
that is more of the future for a lot of these apps um, versus taking that out and creating its own um, experience. I agree, like almost exactly. I, I was trying to imagine what a Reels app would be. And I was like, oh, it's just TikTok. And so because Instagram and Twitter, well, uh, Instagram and Facebook and now Reddit, fun fact, um, they have the option to be photo sharing, have their own, like their own thing that they're known for, sh- sharing photos, updates on Facebook, and have the opportunity to also do short form content. I think Reels would be a bit of, you know, uh, a regression. Um, of the capabilities that Instagram and Facebook now have. Yeah. I mean, if we think to, you know, um, we just had the the founder of Foursquare on Gray Matter. And I remember when Foursquare came out with Swarm, um, it was not met with uh, with open arms from the existing users, but the new users really liked it. And that's one of the things that um, Dennis Crowley talks about. Um and so it just made me kind of made me go there as we as we thought about um, the potential for reels. But Instagram could be more and more reels every day. I would rather see Vine come back. I miss Vine. That was my middle school, which beats me severely. But oh my god, <laughs> bring back Vine, bring back Vine, please. So many TikToks. Bring I'm sorry, back Vine. I was going to say so many TikToks have comments like, "This is Vine energy." And I'm like, "Great, then bring it back." <laughs> it, it was before its that. time, exactly. I love that. Um, okay, so let's jump over to Twitter for a moment. Um, Twitter launched a newsletter subscription button right on users' profiles. Um, Amanda, talk to us about this because this could be this could be really really interesting for those who have newsletters. This is pretty interesting, and it also speaks a little bit to Twitter's um, strategy, which I'll talk about in a second. But first, Twitter's testing a feature for some users that allow followers to subscribe to their newsletter feature called Review directly in the app instead of sending you to an outside website. So right under your Twitter bio, there's going to be a button. It looks kind of like a pinned tweet, and it gives followers the option to subscribe. Uh, we've been talking about this, comparing it to Patreon. It's actually more specifically like a Substack um, where you know you can write newsletters, you can send it out to your followers, and and users can actually pay and, and monetize um, for that additional content that they get. What I was mentioning at the beginning, though, is how Twitter's been kind of holistically attracting creators in ways that I think most social platforms are not thinking about. You know, when we think about what we consider to be a traditional social channel, Twitter is actually going beyond that and looking at how people are interacting online. There's a huge Substack community. There's a huge Patreon community. We have, you know, other platforms, adult and not, that are really monetizing content for for creators. Um and Twitter's looking at it in that way um, versus looking at it in the way that you kind of see the Facebook, TikTok, uh, Clubhouse game kind of all taking features from each other. Twitter seems like it's zooming out a little bit and understanding what kind of tools do creators have at their at their disposal um, and how do they bring those into what we consider social media that might not have been considered before. So Twitter's been doing a lot of really interesting updates. And I think some people, you know, ourselves included have looked at it and thought what's you know the overarching strategy here but but i think they really are trying to understand how can they give things to creators that they don't have already and that other platforms are not able to provide in one place yeah tommy what do you think about all that i think this is a really interesting new feature especially after the death the the death of fleets rip um it seems like twitter is moving away from they stole store not stole stories but everyone's using stories so like okay now we'll use our own stories even though that it didn't work for a reason and they got rid of it pretty promptly, like it only had a shelf life of a few months. But I think Twitter is now positioning itself as a place where culture almost happens. They're giving these creators, they're giving these brands a way to connect more and more intimately, to get their ideas and their personality and their point of view across in just a simple subscribe and send out, you know, a simple newsletter. And I think like I use Twitter as a place, like Instagram's photos of your friends, you know, that's how it's viewed. But I think Twitter, because it's so text heavy and this newsletter option is just another way to push that forward. I really think that is trying to position itself out of the game that Instagram and TikTok and all these other apps are playing and position itself as a place where culture is made and where brands can really influence and interact with culture in a way that they can't on other platforms. You actually bring up a really good point, Tommy, because we look at the death of fleets. Um, I love when we say it, it's always so dramatic. We look at the death of fleets, which, yes, which is almost the exact opposite of a newsletter. It's a thing that's quick, 
It lasts for 24 hours. It's not long form. It's not copy heavy. And this kind of focus on deeper conversations, deeper thoughts, more information, more in-depth and nuanced ways to communicate things. It does feel like they're shifting their direction from this quick hitting, gone in 60 seconds, you know, slice of life piece into like really, really being like the platform for thought and for kind of information sharing. So I think they're, they're, they're doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Do you think, uh, do you think this would make writing a newsletter more appealing for brands if it's readily available on Twitter? Absolutely. I think getting to a Substack or a Patreon is really difficult. I, I subscribe to a few um, and they are only ones that I've had a personal referral to. I don't, it's really hard to find new newsletters, to find relevant information. But on Twitter, it's really easy to find accounts to follow and things that are, you know, relevant to your interests. So them using that discovery, but partnering it with a deeper conversation tool like a newsletter it's really, it's, it's a recipe um, for, for getting the right people in the door to read your content that I think the other platforms ha- are lacking a bit. Yeah. And Tommy, as somebody who writes a newsletter for that, you know, is the, the sister to this podcast, um, do you think this is, this is a worthwhile feature? Oh, definitely. And I think also like same thing with Substack that Amanda was saying earlier, I follow a few, but they're only writers who I've respected and known for a while and the fact that now, great, we can post our newsletter on somewhere else besides LinkedIn uh, and just have it readily, readily available on Twitter for all who are interested without having to make the leap of finding a new platform and paying. I think there's so much that could be offered because of that and a lot of new growth that could come because of that. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. It's, I really like what, what Twitter's up to. Okay, Tommy, talk to us about TikTok and their partnership with Shopify. You mentioned, uh, you were like, oh, dun, dun, dun. Instagram's getting rid of swiping up. To me, this is the dun, dun, dun. Twitter, TikTok rather, is partnering with Shopify to allow for in-app purchasing. Um, So select merchants will be able to already partnered with Shopify will be able to um, put product catalogs on their accounts. And there's even a, a little storefront feature that comes with the page with this feature when you partner with Shopify and have a TikTok account. And to me, this is deadly. Uh, my wallet is already crying out. Instagram already is good at you know seeing things that are targeted so specifically to you. But TikTok is known for this algorithm that is it is for you, truly. I get caught on my feed that I'm like, how do they know? Like who who's watching me? Where's the cameras? And so the fact that they're going to start offering in-app purchasing soon, powered through this algorithm that's still, you know, unknowable, kind of a deity. Um, it makes me a little scared, but also very interested to see how things will shake out of this. What do you think, Amanda? Yeah, and from a brand lens too, I mean, you zoom out, which I love a good zoom out, um, and you think about how maybe a decade ago or, or more, you might have driven to a shopping mall, looked in a window of a store, loved a display, tried something on, bought it, took it home, fell in love with it more, etc. And I think now that every social platform, almost every social platform has a really, really accessible shopping feature, it's time to really take seriously the shift of e-commerce um, and how the needle's moving like a lot faster and a lot more quickly into this idea of social commerce um, and how that impacts purchase behavior. I think it, this has been something obviously that that we've been looking at for a while as advertisers and brands, but this is kind of the last platform where y- you don't need to think more than 10 seconds. You can purchase something and it's in your cart. So how does our advertising and our marketing communications understand that behavior and keep this in mind as we're making content, as we're partnering with co- content creators, as we're you know talking about our products and putting it in front of people. I, I think this is again a, a year or a couple of years where it's going to be really, really industry changing for e-commerce, um, and it's exciting. It's a, it's kind of a new era of of purchase behavior. Yeah, I think about like a brand who may have been apprehensive to get on TikTok, and I think this might be the door that they needed to maybe put their foot in. Um, but it is also interesting too, to see, you know, typically on this show, we are saying how Facebook and Instagram are taking a page from TikTok. And now it's interesting to see TikTok sort of, I don't know if punching above its weight class is the right 
turn of phrase, but now they are sort of pulling one from from the Facebooks and Instagrams and uh, YouTubes. So very interesting stuff. Yeah, and I, I hope and I think that perhaps they might have also learned some lessons from Instagram's um, addition of shopping features into their platform. It was not very positively received originally. Um, and I don't think it's clear how, how effective it's been in the last year or two. Um, but I, I think TikTok very easily could have learned some lessons about how to take their platform in a direction that their users, you know, feel is still native and authentic to what they're using it for without making it too commercial. Um, so we'll see if they, they took that to heart. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Amanda, this is my dun, dun, dun moment, Tommy. (laughs) Amanda, take us home. Let's talk about Instagram removing the swipe up feature and replacing it with stickers. It's actually probably not a dun, dun, dun moment. It, it, we can call this the death of the swipe up, just like we talk about the death of the fleets. Um, Instagram is saying goodbye to the swipe up button, which is the iconic call to action for every sponsored post in an Instagram story. Instead of a little swipe up button, it will now be a sticker that creators can put wherever they want in the Instagram story and will link out to a website. It gives users more control over how it looks within their story versus an automatic template. Um, And it sounds like they'll be rolling this out to more users on the platform as well. It used to be that I think you had to have 10,000 followers to access a swipe up feature in your story. So when you, again, I love a good zoom out. When you zoom out and think about the larger implications of this, first, you couldn't respond to an Instagram story that had a swipe up. So content creators or influencers couldn't have a dialogue when they were posting sponsored content, um, they would usually have to break it up over other stories if they wanted to to have a, a DM conversation with their followers. But secondly, it sounds like Instagram is starting to understand there's a big impact that micro influencers or people that maybe are under 10k followers have on the platform. So now these these creators can, you know, work with brands and can have a very short journey from their channels to, you know, a product page or a learn more page or more content or a blog and things like that. So it seems like Instagram's taking kind of their smaller influencers and content creators a little more seriously um, and letting people share links on the platform. And I will mention they're still evaluating it. I think it's in a beta test. They did mention that they're going to look to creators to weigh in on whether this is kind of a good update or a bad update, which says a lot. Instagram doesn't usually do that. So I think they're, again, taking their content creators really seriously, understanding that there's more than just the macro influencers that started, you know, their rise on the platform. Um, but yeah, they're, they're thinking about their creators a little bit more. We like to see it. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, it should help with discoverability. Um, you know, I know for, for a podcast, for example, Instagram is not really the best way to, to promote because you know, you have to swipe up and there's a lot of steps to get to actually listening or get to actually the point of purchase. But um, I think with the link in a sticker that could be could be uh, a lot faster of a, uh, a path to to that call to action. Uh, Tommy, did you have any thoughts on that? I was going to say something similar, actually, to what you said. I think it'll be a lot more seamless, the actual experience of it. But what I'm interested in is how will this affect the presentation of stories? The swipe up feature may have taken longer, but it was easy and seamless so that it wouldn't affect the actual aesthetic of your stories where a sticker could be, you know, it couldn't, it could not gel with the actual thing you're presenting. I'm wondering how brands, how interactive it will be in terms of design so that brands have a really strict color palette or strict visual style, be able to make it mesh with their, you know, their visual flow. And so, yeah, but I think, again, what you mentioned, especially now that's going to people less than 10,000 followers, because that's a issue, that's a, a contentious issue with so many micro-influencers. I think it's going to be interesting to see how things kind of play out with this. And I know I'm interested to see how brands I follow will be able to make it work for them when they're so, for brands that are especially so uniquely visual focused in one way. Yeah, I'm imagining a layout that just has like a bright orange circle that says link goes here or something, you know, and then our clients will have to approve that. Um, but it should be interesting. Uh, we will see. Um, all right, friends. Well, that does it for us this week. Uh, we want to, again, thank and welcome Tommy Boyce to the show. He's been writing uh, the things for us for the past couple of weeks, doing a wonderful job. And again, as always, Amanda Davis, thank you so much. You are our, you are our favorite Amanda Davis. 
And of course, uh, Danielle Hunt behind the scenes. She keeps things moving and grooving. And so that does it for us this week. If you don't already follow us, follow us on Apple and Spotify. Be sure to follow Gray on all of our social channels so that you can get all the updates on the five things. Uh, feel free to email us at any time at podcast at gray.com. And just a quick little program note, it is the end of summer. So we will be taking next week off for Labor Day, giving everyone a little chance to take a break. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks with more from The Five Things. I'm Joey Scarillo. Thank you very much. The Five Things are produced by Joey Scarillo and Danielle Hunt. Mixed at Gramercy Park Studios by Guy Rosemarin with support from post-producer Ned Martin. Additional support by John Jenkinson and Christina Hyde. Gray is a global creative agency whose mission is putting famously effective ideas into the world. Check out more at gray.com.